Good morning, everyone. Today, it's a cute and gloomy day here in San Francisco. It's raining, we're, we're getting hit with like a storm this whole week, but this morning, um, I am getting this cute little banner ready. I got this from Target and I got this other create your own banner also from Target. Uh, my roommate is getting his PhD tomorrow. I'll decorate the kitchen and make it all cute for him for him after his um, dissertation seminar. So that's what I'm doing today. And then I'll have I have these golden balloons that I blew up that I will hang on top. I'll make time for this. It's just, this is a big deal, you know? Like I know how hard I mean I'm obviously in a different becoming a different type of doctor, but honestly becoming anything that involves going to grad school is is just a huge deal and I think it's worth celebrating. So and you know, get the recognition that he deserves. Also man's is literally curing pancreatic cancer as we speak so he's doing big things in the world you know he's making a real difference in his lives honestly even if he wasn't i would have done this for him but he's extra making a difference in the world so i think we should celebrate it i don't know if i've updated the world but i'm in san francisco right now doing research at ucsf um i work in a lung transplant lab which is really cool um, it is a mouse lab, so that was like a big change for me because I have only done clinical research in undergrad and I have not done like wet lab work or really anything. It's been very exciting. I've learned a lot. Um, I've grown a lot. You should have seen me when I first started working in this lab. I would literally scream when the mice would like move. Like even if they just kind of like walked around in their cage, I would freak out. Actually, there's a story time behind that. So I have to go through like a training, right? Like they don't just let randos walk into the mouse room and handle them, right? I went through a training, but in the training class where we learn how to inject mice, so that's part of like the basic mouse training. Luckily in my lab, I knew that the mice that we would inject would be anesthetized, so they'd be asleep. But when we were in training, they were awake and vicious. Like they were feisty. I got bit in my first training. Twice, actually. It bit through the two layers of glove. I was just so stressed out, panicky, like freaking out. Every time it would, the mice would like squirm in my hand, I would drop it. So then <laughs> someone would have to like catch it on the table before it jumped off and started running around in the room. So honestly, my first experience with the mice were just, was just not good. So I started off on like such a bad foot. Um, the day that the mice bit me, the my instructor was also... You know those people that just hate their lives, hate their jobs, hate everything, and they take it out on like other people because they hate their lives? That was my instructor. She like hated her life. She hated me, it felt like. I mean, I was brand new, never worked with mice before, never worked with like any animals before. So like, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, and she was just sassing me the whole time. She was not being helpful. She wasn't teaching me anything. She was just like, okay, do it. And I'm like, what do you mean do it? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. So she failed me that day. What a freaking experience. I'm traumatized, but I could not inject it. It bit me twice. So I have to go back and do it again. <sighs> Which was honestly so frustrating because just to get this class took like two and a half months or something because they're so booked out and because of COVID. So I was so stressed out that my PI was literally gonna like slaughter me because I was in charge of the mouse colonies, but I can't do anything with the mouse colonies until I get approved to get into the lark facilities and to get approved to get into the lark facilities, I have to pass this basic mouse training. So I told my lab mates and they were like, honestly, it's fine. Like, it's a scary experience at first. Like, you'll get it. And then they told me about this other guy who's like a lot nicer. He's like one of the other instructors. So I went to him and I was still freaked out, like at the beginning of like our one-on-one -on -one redo of the class. I was still panicky. All right, you guys, we're on our way to inject this fucking mouse. We're injecting it and we're doing it successfully. I believe, I believe it's happening. He was actually a very good teacher. Like he was actually teaching, he was explaining what you need to do when the other lady was just like, do it. And I'm like, I, I don't know what to do. She also misled me like twice. So whatever she taught me, I was doing with the other guy. And he was like, yeah, no, don't do that. That's how you're gonna get bit. And I was like, 
wow, who would have thought? Maybe that's why I got bit, right? Um, so as the class went on, it was only like an hour, hour and a half. Um, I could see myself being more comfortable and just, you know, performing better. I finally passed, which was awesome. Now it's been a couple months like four, three, four months. And I love seeing the growth that has happened. Honestly, it's been really good. I'm so happy living here. There's not enough words to express like the gratitude that I have and like the life that I'm living right now. Like this is, like I've prayed for this. I dreamt of this. Like this is the definition of living my best life. I live in the city. I get to do fun city girl things. I have the best roommates, like, I had the cutest little house. It's just adorable. And we're best friends with our neighbors and like everyone's super cute. And like, <sighs> I'm so grateful, but I'll take you guys with me. Uh, we, he did this like super cute um, montage thing that he wants to make. So his hair all through COVID, he grew it out to like, like this, like it was super long. And so the other day he, um, he decided he wanted to cut it and so the night before that he went to cut it we like we hair we did his hair in different styles i like straightened it for him and then we curled it and he had it in a bunch of braids and like he did like really cute little hairstyles and stuff and took a bunch of different pictures so that he can remember that you know how long his hair was and stuff um and then he very symbolically the next morning went and cut off his hair two days before he got his or he's is getting his phd so it's really cute he looks so cute now it's like it's so nice um but i think i have a little i have a little time lapse that i can show you guys of him doing his little hair montage which was really cute um and then i'll take you with me tomorrow when he presents his dissertation uh, which will be awesome it'll be so so fun um so i'm super excited for him i'm so proud that He's doing big things, but anyways, we'll see you there. Thanks for joining me on my little creative afternoon, morning. I don't even know what time it is, but thanks. Bye. Anthony, we just want to say that we appreciate you being the papa of our home. You really have kept us solid together. We wish you the best of luck in Philly, man. I think that's where you're going. I don't know. I think he's going to Oh my god, dude, you're going to stay! It's pure joy right there, man. Well, dude, you know, Stanford, you're so close. Hope you bike up. You can spend the night on the couch, dude. No worries. In his own house. <laughs> um, you know, you found the discovery of science in you. I hope you cherish that for the rest of your life and find many more discoveries in life. Okay, well, Anthony, you're going to kill it. We're really excited to see. I'm very excited to learn about what you're actually studying, even though you've explained it to me like 12 times. Um, and yeah, we're just so proud of you. You're so thoughtful and you definitely tie the whole house together. So we're glad that you're hopefully not going too far. Anthony, best roommate ever, one of the smartest people I know, most successful person I know, and about to kill this presentation in front of all your fans. Um, it's been real. Excited to see your hair go. Um, excited to hang and party with you after this and after your Iron Man. Good luck with everything. Hi, Anthony. Congrats on this amazing accomplishment. Thank you so much for including us um, in this. And thank you so much for, for just being you. You're amazing. You inspire me in so many ways, even though I just met you a few months ago. You're amazing, and I'm so happy for you.
<laughs> um, yeah, so I cannot say how proud I am. We've just come such a long way. I remember when you first started, um, some of the people might be surprised to know that you were a little shy. <laughs> so much so that you didn't really tell me you were rotating. <laughs> and I found out from a neighboring lab that, oh, yeah, Anthony's like rotating with you. And I said, but I thought Austin's rotating. <laughs> no, no, it's like a different guy. It's like, Austin and Anthony, Anthony's a and then on Monday morning, Anthony shows up and says, oh, no, I'm here for my rotation. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, yeah. uh, great. Um, and uh, Anthony, as you know, has, been, has had a long-standing interest in, in, you know, in immunotherapy, cancer immunotherapy, cancer immunology. And as most of you probably know, I don't really know anything about immunology, at least back then. And when he started, he said, I really, you know, I'm really interested in this topic, and, you know, but I really like what you're doing, and um, I wonder whether there's like a happy middle ground that we can find. And so we really worked hard to find a cool project that would be interesting to Anthony from the cancer immunology side, but certainly you know based in cell biology and, and really interesting to me. And we had just done some proteomics, and Anthony was telling all about it, and it sort of in his rotation, he did some key experiments, and boom, that just opened the door to like a really exciting area of research for us. He has now brainwashed me into <laughs> sticking with immunology a little bit more, so much so that I'm so proud to be invited to the IG Equity Immunology Symposia tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so perhaps I am a little bit of a little mini card carrying. Probably wouldn't say that, but anyway. Um, okay, so to go his evolution in my lab, I have to start at the start. Um, <laughs> and you know he was very committed. He was he was really wanting to make a difference and really, you know, hit the ground running, as you'll see here. <laughs> Please play. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for coming out to uh, to my dissertation talk today. Um, I joined the BMS program in 2016. Thanks to my family that actually flew out, and I'm very happy that I could actually have this. Meeting. So, I really appreciate everyone that traveled out here, and also family and friends that, that came out to, to see my talk. But uh, yeah, today I will be uh, talking first of what I've been working on for the past four or five years, which is looking at how this process of autophagy can facilitate immune evasion in pancreatic cancer by this down regulation of MHC class 1, which is a dangerous agent. You'll see this, uh, I'll explain it to you all in, um, in hopefully Lamy's terms in the beginning and then it gets a little convoluted with all the details that I, that I go into. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm obviously here. If you have any questions, please, uh, please uh, direct them on the way. But yeah, so um, yeah, thanks uh, and welcome. So I always like to always take a step back and remember why I'm doing the work that I'm doing right now. So just, uh, oops, is this still? Uh, so a show of hands over here, who here knows who has lost a loved one to cancer? So virtually everyone in this room has had a loved one lost to, uh, lost to cancer. It is indiscriminate and you know that it, it won't, um, it'll, it'll take the lives of your neighbors, your, uh, your loved ones, um, maybe even uh, you, you've been affected by it um, personally as well, but it is indiscriminate. And um, this, is a, this is a graph that I saw about the five-year survival rate of people who have cancer. So with all cancers, there are about, um, the five-year survival rate in the 70s was about 50%. And since then, um, in the last decade, it's increased to about 67%. And there's a spectrum of the survival of people who have cancer. So uh, say for prostate cancer and thyroid cancer, the prognosis is very, very high. But what I've been working on has been pancreatic cancer, which is right at the bottom of this list. So I, I saw this as an unmet need in, um, in the medical community, and I want to see whether or not I can sort of increase that prognosis um, because many people have been affected by this disease, and when you're diagnosed, a lot of the times it's, it's very, very lethal. So, most recently, in the past um, two years, we have a musical icon, Ruth Franklin, a uh, civil rights activist, John Lewis. We have Alex Trebek, who's a, uh, the host of uh, Jeopardy, and then you have um, Justice Ruth, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So they have all succumbed to pancreatic cancer in the past two years. Um, 
So this is also, these are just a couple of the famous people that, that we know uh, that have come to this disease, but there are also family members and, and loved ones that, that you may have known uh, that have lost their lives to this disease. So in 2011, the five-year survival rate for pancreatic cancer was just about 6%. So when I started grad school, it was it went up to about 8%. And then just in 2020, the, the survival rate finally hit the double digits, which is about 10%. It's still very low, so there's still that unmet need in the medical community to try to find different kinds of therapy options for those who have pancreatic cancer. Um, so I just want to go back to this slide right here. Uh, when you look at um, the trend, what we're actually seeing here is a prognosis of patients that are diagnosed with cancer, and that has increased drastically from the 70s to the most recent decade. So what's happened in the past decade was the development of cancer therapeutics. Many of you guys know that um, chemotherapy is one of the things that's been used in cancer, but it non-discriminately um, um, targets both normal and healthy cells, normal and, and cancer cells. So um, more recently, scientists have uh, developed immunotherapy in which scientists um, harness the power of your own immune system to recognize cancer and uh, uh, cancer cells specifically. So the way that this works is that um, what you have over here is the immune system. So this is just uh, one of the examples of, um, of one of the immune cells that you have in your body. So it's a positive T cell. Um, when, when there is an insult, say, like an injection or there's an unwanted cell in your body like a cancer cell, these immune cells can be act become activated and actually elicit killing effects on their target, which should be the cancer cells in the case of those who have cancer. With immunotherapy, you can activate these, these immune cells so that they can recognize these danger signals that are on the cell surface of tumor cells and eliminate them. So unfortunately, um, with this type of therapy, pancreatic cancer actually does not respond. And this is a paper that was published in, uh, uh, in 2017 from, from a group at Hopkins that looks at the correlation between the mutational burden and the response to the immunotherapy. So on the x-axis, you have the number of coding somatic mutations, and on the y-axis, you have objective response rates to that immunotherapy. As you can see, if you have more mutations, you're more likely to respond to immunotherapy, such as melanoma. But like I said, pancreatic cancer, or PDAC, which is what I'll be referring to um, pancreatic cancer does not have uh, any kind of response rate to pancreatic uh, to, to to immunotherapy, uh, and a lot of the things that that contribute to this are one can be the immunosuppressive tumor marker environment in PDAC. So there are a lot of different kinds of mechanisms that tune down the immune system so that it can no longer um, recognize these immune cells. Um, that's that's one of the things that that can happen uh, just within pancreatic cancer. And then uh, another third point that I also wanted to make is that nearly all PDAC samples have harbor these potential, potentially targetable neoantigens. So these neoantigens are um, targetable by immunotherapy, but um, we have to figure out a way that we can actually make um, these PDAC cells respond to immunotherapy because they have these neoantigens. So um, this is going into a couple of key features in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which is the most common cancer of the pancreas. So there are about 55,000 patients that are diagnosed yearly with a very low prognosis. So the median survival is less than 10%. And what I have on this slide are just a couple of the key features. So the genetics are well-defined in pancreatic cancer. There are greater than 90% of activating mutations in KRS. And um, over time, as this, uh, as this tumor, as, as these normal pancreatic um, epithelial cells actually differentiate into um, uh, differentiate and go through these different stages, they eventually become pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. So you go through these three different stages, uh, and with each increasing stage, you have accumulation of these, um, uh, um, you have accumulation of tumors, oh, sorry, accumulation of mutations in, in tumor suppressors such as TP53 and CDK and 2 a At the same time, with these increasing stages, you have uh, these tumor cells that exist in a very desmoplastic and hypoxic and micro environment. And one of the ways that these tumor cells can actually um, uh, adapt to, to these different kinds of stresses in the environment is by upregulating up these different processes called autophagy and macropenocytosis. So it's possible that these um, processes could be playing a significant role 
the regulation of immunity. So that's one of the things that I want to look into. And like I said um, in the previous slide, there are only a limited number of therapy options that exist for those who have pancreatic cancer. So one of the things that I wanted to bring up is, remember I mentioned both autophagy and macroprenocytosis are these processes that are upregulated in pancreatic cancer. So both of these processes actually converge on this degradative uh, organelle called the lysosome. And um, autophagy is this um, evolutionarily conserved process that has this double membrane that engulfs uh, material within the cell, such as damaged organelles or unused proteins in the cell, that can um, then traffic it over to the lysosome for its degradation. And then at the same time, there's also this process called macroprenocytosis that uh, does a, a non-selective bulk uptake from the extracellular space. Um, so there, it's an endocytic pathway that takes in these uh, extracellular components and then that can converge it onto the lysosome for degradation that will eventually lead to um, what I'll show in the, in, the, in the next two slides, how it can actually con uh, confer any kind of survival advantage to the tumor itself. But the lysosome, I like to compare it to uh, Pac-Man because it's this thing that likes to eat things. So anytime you think about the lysosome, just remember this is kind of a, a degradative organelle that can actually eat things. So like I said, going back to the lysosomal degradation pathway, um, what we show in pancreatic cancer is that when Rashiba was a, a postdoc um, at MassGen, she showed that in the primary patient samples, you have normal on the left and on the right you have a patient that has pancreatic cancer. And they, she showed that there are 12 times more lysosomes in these pancreatic cancer patients. So there must be a reason why people who have pancreatic cancer upregulate this process. There must be a way that these tumor cells are sort of somehow adapting so that they can actually survive. So one of the things that can happen is that these lysosomes can actually um, recycle building blocks. So these building blocks are really important for providing energy, new metabolites, and it can help support macromolecule synthesis for, for the cancer cells to survive. And then a big aspect of what the Pereira lab studies is how the lysosome itself can remodel the proteome. Because What's happening is that these lysosomes are degrading certain proteins. So there's a selective removal of certain proteins that can somehow contribute to a survival advantage to the, the tumor itself. So it can contribute these to aberrant features of the cancer cells. Um, and there have been many groups that have published that when you do a genetic perturbation of these, these processes right here, or even just block the activity of the lysosome itself, that can inhibit the tumor growth. But the thing is, we don't know exactly how that's occurring. So one of the missions that we do in this lab is try to understand how this is actually occurring. So this is what we end up uh, doing in the lab. Uh, a lot of the projects actually come from this, but we want to try to find what is happening and what is being selectively targeted to a cancer lysosome. So what we have over here is this lysotag. Um, this lysotag is something that uh, that targets the lysosome itself. So the TMEM192 is a tag that's selectively on the surface of the lysosome that is fused to an MRFP tag and a 3SHA affinity handle. So what you can do is that you could, um, you could engineer cells to express this lysotag, and it'll only tag the lysosomes. So what I did was we, um, we ended up engineering cells, normal cells that have no mutations, that's just a normal epithelial, pancreatic epithelial cell, um, and then we also engineered the tumor cells, the pancreatic cancer, to see what happens if we isolate the tumors, the, sorry, the lysosomes from a normal cell versus a cancer cell, and we can do comparative analysis through proteomics to see what are the things that are being targeted and selectively targeted to a cancer lysosome. So we sent this off for mass spec, and what you have on the right, so on the right side of this volcano plot, is the proteins that are enriched in the pancreatic cancer lysosomes. On the left, you have those that are enriched in, so HPD is the human pancreatic ductal epithelial, so anything on the left is normal. Anything on the right is enriched in, in the cancer lysosomes. And when you look through the list of proteins that are selectively targeted, one of the proteins that I did find was this molecule called MHC class one. So if you remember from my slide, one of the things that I showed you is that when you have immunotherapy and there are these um, there are these immune cells that are trying to recognize the cancer cells, they have this danger signal that's on the cell surface. So MHC class one is one of those danger signals that, um, that the immune system can recognize. 
And we show that this is selectively targeted to the cancer lysosome itself. So my question became, why is it being targeted to the lysosome? So one of the things that happens is that this MHC class one, so this is called major histocompatibility complex one, right here, so it's um, delineated as MHC one. That's important for antigen presentation to T cells. So these antigens are produced by the tumor cells that can be, um, that can be loaded onto these MHC1 complexes, and this serves as that danger signal. So when these MHC1 molecules are loaded with antigen, it can signal over to the immune system, say the CD8 positive T cell. The CD8 positive T cell recognizes this tumor cell and then eliminates it. So that's, that's the purpose of the MHC1 in, in cancer. And evasion of host immunity just in general is a hallmark of cancer. So there are three major things that I just want to mention over here. So one is the antigenicity, so um, the failure to produce these antigens or defects in antigen presentation. So if you get rid of this, that's one way that um, cancer can, can progress and, and, and avoid an immune response. Another thing that I had mentioned earlier was just the microenvironment. So there's an immunopressive mechanism such as the uh, upregulation of these um, um, different kinds of molecules such as PD-1 and PD-L1, upregulation of um, immune inhibitory cells such as regulatory T cells and myelin-derived suppressor cells, and then also the immunosuppressive cytokines that are also produced in this microenvironment. And then also the immunogenicity is, uh, this is considered a cold tumor because what we want in, uh, in a tumor to respond to, um, to, to the immune response is something that has a lot of T cells so that the T cells can actually eliminate those, uh, those tumors. But in, in, in pancreatic cancer, you have poor T cell infiltration, so not as many of those um, ninja CD8 positive T cells. So my major question now became, um, how do PDA cells utilize this autophagy lysosome pathway as a strategy to downregulate MHC1 from, from the cell surface or the, from, from the plasma membrane? So one of the things that you can do is that uh, using this tag here, you have to confirm what you first did with the, the proteomics. So you just take the lysosome elute. So it's essentially like pulling down on this tag right here. There's a way that you can pull down on this tag right here to just isolate the lysosomes and see whether or not you're actually getting more of this MAC1 danger signal in the lysosomes itself. So you can you can compare it from normal cells, which are the HPDE cells right here, to two or three different tumor cell lines, PDEC cell lines, so it says, um, POP2898, T, Mayapaka, and KP4, and you can show that. So this is this this Western blot right here is actually a way that you can measure how much protein is in, in, in a cell. So this, if you have a darker pattern, that means that there's more protein that's present. So with the PDA cell lines, the three over here, you see that in these lysosomes specifically, you're getting more of that protein within the lysosome itself. And then when you do lysosomal inhibition, so when you use E6040 and papistatin, these are just um, protease inhibitors that block activity of the lysosome itself. You can see that they're actually accumulating within the lysosomes, meaning that these, um, these MHC1 molecules are actually getting targeted to the lysosome as a carbo and being degraded. But when you block that activity of the lysosome, you no longer degrade that um, MHC1 molecule and you get uh, more, more of that present within the lysosome itself. And another thing, I think this is uh, this is great because you can actually visually see what is going on when you do confocal imaging. So what you can do over here is that you can tag the different molecules. So MHC1 here is shown in green. Um, LAMP1 is a marker for the lysosomes themselves, and then you can also just merge images to see where exactly are these MHC1 molecules. So in the normal cell, you actually see that these MHC1 molecules are localized to the cell surface. And then when you look at uh, a number of PDA cell lines, you can see that they're primarily intracellular. You don't see that at the cell surface. There are, and you see there's a fraction of them, a significant fraction of these um, lysosomes, or sorry, of these MHC1 molecules that are co-localizing with the lysosomes themselves. If you look even closer, there are three different scenarios that you could actually see. Um, so if you look at the open arrowheads, you could actually see these MHC1 molecules within the lysosome itself. At the same time, you can also see that there are MHC1 molecules in green that are just by itself. And with the asterisk, you can see that there are lysosomes that, are, that do not have MHC1 molecules. So my, my, question, my next question became, how do these MHC1 molecules get targeted to the lysosome? So one of the things that I want to bring up is that same kind of 
uh, diagram that I brought up earlier, remember with the process of autophagy, you have these LC3B autophagosomes. So the autophagosomes themselves are these double membrane structures that can engulf their substrates and then beat it over to the lysosome itself. So the whole idea is that maybe these MAT1 molecules are being engulfed by autophagosomes so that they can be delivered to the lysosome itself. So same, same um, technique that I used before when you do confocal imaging, you can show, I show that now I'm not staining for the lysosome, but I'm staining for these autophagosomes using an LC3B marker. And I show that similar to what we showed previously, the HPDE cells have primarily um, plasma membrane MHC class one, whereas the PDA cell lines have primarily intracellular. And then you can see that there's a significant co-localization of these MHC1 molecules within autophagosomes. So these autophagosomes, based off of this result over here, seems to be um, leading these lysosomes over, uh, leading these MHC1 molecules over to the lysosome for its degradation. And then this is just um, another image that we have. So this is looking specifically at primary um, patient PDA samples. So these were resected from patients that have um, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And we can show that there is a significant portion of these MHC1 molecules that are within the cell. So these MHC1 molecules aren't getting to the cell surface to signal to over to the immune system to get rid of them. So we think that these MHC1 molecules are selectively targeted to the lysosome so that they can hide from the immune system. So what I have showed you so far is that in normal cells, so the MHC1 molecules are shown in, in red right here. In the normal cells, you can see that these MHC1 molecules are primarily at the cell surface and can get trafficked um, over there's, there's, it's a dynamically regulated process, but we show that in normal cells that these MHC1 molecules are primarily at the cell surface. Whereas in the PDA cells, you can sh we show that there's less MHC1 molecules at the cell surface, and instead it's actually being um, it's, it's actually being targeted to these autophagosomes, um, and then eventually fusing with the lysosome for its degradation. So. My question now is how is MHC1 trafficked over to the lysosome itself? So this gets into more of the, um, the molecular biology and the uh, mechanism of how this specifically is occurring. So I'm getting really into the, the details here. So one of the things that I wanted to see is whether or not there is some sort of molecular adapter or Ha <laughs> ha! 